This is a lecture on section 2.2, the structure of the atom. Many of us have seen this symbol here, over here in the right top corner of the sheet of the symbol of an atom. We have the particles in the center with these other particles in some sort of circular orbit. So what we're going to do here is we're going to talk a little bit about the history of this, determining the structure of the atom. And one of the findings of years of research is that the atom can be broken down into what are called subatomic particles or subatomic constituents. And those three particles are called the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons. So a little bit of history. There is a property of some elements which is called radioactivity. And in radioactivity, atoms of specific elements produce high energy particles. They radiate out high energy particles. And when that happens, the element or the atom decreases in mass. So that energy that is flying off is taking mass with it. Sometimes these elements can even transmute, convert into other elements. For example, uranium can be transmuted into thorium or potassium can be transmuted into argon. Some of these particles possess mass, but the mass depends on the type of the particle that's emitted. Sometimes the particles are electrically charged, but it depends, the amount of charge they have depends on which type of particle it is. And some of these particles possess no mass and no electrical charge, but they do possess energy. So the idea then would be that you have an atom, and this atom is somehow unstable. It undergoes some sort of internal process by which it emits a different particle, which is generally, generally either no mass or a small amount of mass. So we'll say it's light mass. And then you end up with something different out here, a different type of particle, a different type of atom, perhaps. So three common particles that can be observed through radioactivity by measuring radioactivity are the alpha particle or the alpha ray, the beta particle or the beta ray, or the gamma particle. So that's the particle that's flying off away from the atom. The alpha ray has essentially the same mass as a helium atom, very close to the mass of a helium atom. The beta is a much lower mass, much smaller, thou, you know, less than a thousandth the mass of an alpha, and gamma rays appear to have no mass at all. In terms of electrical charge, the alpha ray is positively charged, the beta ray is negatively charged, and the gamma ray has no charge at all. So notice these are the two ways in which we're describing these particles. We're describing them in terms of mass and electrical charge. So let's talk about the subatomic particles now. The electron. The electron has electrical charge. The standard unit in the SI system of electrical charge is called the Coulomb, and the abbreviation for Coulomb is a C, capital C. So J.J. Thompson used what's called a cathode ray tube to determine the charge to mass ratio of the electron, a very famous calculation. So in a cathode ray tube, what you can do is you can evacuate a glass tube, or you can put a little bit of a gas in there, like nitrogen gas that's not chemically reactive, and then you have a metal electrode here called a cathode, and you apply a voltage to that cathode. So there's a voltage across these two pieces of metal here. And this metal is positive with respect to this one in terms of voltage, so positive compared to negative. And when you turn it on, what'll happen is the particles will stream through away from the negative terminal and toward the positive. And if you put a little hole through this piece of metal, they'll keep on flying on through that hole. And if you put a magnet here, you can deflect them. You can deflect them up this way. If you turn the magnet around and flip it the other way, 
reflect out that way. If you take the magnet away, they'll go straight on through. Okay. Now, if there's a little bit of gas in here, like nitrogen, that, that gas will start to glow. It'll produce light as these particles that are streaming off the metal collide with those gas molecules. You'll see the light coming off. So these particles are called cathode rays. So they're coming off of the cathode. And you can even put phosphorus, if you paint phosphorus onto the surface here, then when those particles hit the phosphorus, they can cause the emission of light. And that's how old televisions actually worked. Through cathode ray tubes. So these cathode rays, we now call them electrons. And what we know is that since they're flying off the negative end and toward the positive, they must be attracted to the positive, they're negatively charged. Okay. So what Thompson was able to do was to measure the not the electrical charge or the mass, but the ratio. He could do calculations using the cathode ray tube to find the ratio of the electrical charge to the mass. And the number that he came out with was 1.76 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. So for every kilogram of mass of this particle, it had this amount of charge, 1.76 times 10 to the 11th coulombs. Well, that's useful, but not too useful unless you can figure out one of these two quantities. Because if you could find the mass and you know the ratio, you could find the charge. Or if you knew the charge and the ratio, you could find the mass, but you need to know one of these to find the other. So, our Robert Milliken used an experiment called the famous oil drop experiment. Here's a picture of the apparatus. This is a viewing scope, so you're actually looking through here using a microscope to look at the little oil droplets moving back and forth based on the voltage that's applied in this liquid. It's a very tedious and difficult experiment to perform. But based on that experiment, Millikan's group was able to determine the electrical charge of the electron. And again, the electron is negatively charged, and that charge came out to negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb, so very, very small. But if you have the electrical charge and you have the ratio from Thomson's experiment, you can now calculate the mass. So taking the charge of the electron, dividing that by the ratio, that gives us the mass of the electron and it is very, very small, 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, tiny. So the next step is to say the following. We know now that the electrons have to come from somewhere, and so the likely source is they're coming from the metal. They're actually just flying off the metal, so the voltage is causing the electrons to be emitted from that metal, so the metal's losing those electrons, but they get replenished through the electrical circuit. So what we know is that atoms are electrically neutral, meaning they don't have any net positive or negative charge. So if they have negatively charged electrons, they must also have a particle that's positive, and that positive particle must be balancing the charge of the negatively charged electrons. We now call those positively charged particles protons. So the idea would be that if an atom had one negative charge, one electron perhaps, it must have one positive charge. If it had two negative charges, it must have two positive charges, so forth and so on. So a famous experiment determining the structure of the atom is what's called the gold foil experiment. And that was performed back in 1910. Here's a picture of the experiment. There's the apparatus and two of the scientists that worked on it. The professor was Ernest Rutherford, the graduate student was Hans Geiger, and then there was an undergraduate student by the name of Ernest Mardson working on it as well. So the idea behind the gold foil experiment is that you take a source of what are called alpha particles, we talked about that in terms of radioactivity, so there are elements that produce alpha particles, which are positively charged and have mass. And you allow those particles to fly through and contact a very, very thin foil of gold. Gold that can be made extremely thin, only hundreds of atoms thick. And measure then what happens to those alpha particles as it passes through the thin foil. So 
if a, if an alpha particle goes right through the material, it'll just come right over here and strike this photographic plate, and that will produce a bright spot on the plate. If the particle is deflected by some small angle, it'll come over here, and that would, when you develop the photo photographic plate, you'll see a bright spot there. Or if it was deflected a large angle, or an extremely large angle, it then might collide over here and give you a bright spot over there. So we know that the atom has negatively charged electrons, and we know it has a positive charge. The question is, where is that positive charge? So here are two, what we might can call competing theories or competing models. So here is one idea that J.J. Thompson had which is now called the plum pudding model. And the idea is that you have these negatively charged electrons and they're embedded in a sphere of positive charge. So there's this sort of diffuse positive charge, like a cloud, and then the electrons are just popped in there. It's called plum pudding because if you make bread and you put little raisins in it, you can think of the positive charges being the bread and the negative charges being the little raisins. Here's another model. This is Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford's model, which we might call the nuclear model. And here the idea is that in the center of the atom, you have the positively charged, positive charge, but those are particles. They're particles of positive charge. So instead of a diffuse cloud of positive charge, you actually have particles called, which we now call protons. And then the electrons, the negatively charged particles, perhaps are in orbit outside of those protons. Okay. Now, the experimental results that you might expect if you had this model is that if an alpha ray, which is a positively charged particle, came in contact with an atom that had this structure, it would interact with this positive charge, be repelled by it, because like charges repel one another. So you might expect it to kind of deflect out something like this. So it might come off at some small angle. But every time that it went through an atom, it should be deflected by that atom. On the other hand, if you have this structure over here, the Rutherford model, then when you have a positive charge, what you would expect is that most of the time, it would miss it. So it just go in straight lines. So if the trajectory of this alpha particle was like this, it would just kind of go straight line, not even be affected by this atom. But every once in a while, the path of the alpha might be that it's right in line with that, what we now call a nucleus. And you'd have a lot of positive charge in a really small area, small volume, and it would probably just bounce off something like that. And so the experiment shows that this is actually what happens, that most of the particles of alpha rays went right on through. So they just went straight through the gold as if there were no atoms there. But on occasion, one of them would be deflected at a very large angle, even back like this. That's not what you would expect with the plum pudding model. That's what you would expect if you had a nuclear model. So what we now know is that this model is incorrect. This one is much closer to what's actually happening in terms of the structure of the atom. So that gives us an atom in which we have electrons, which are negatively charged outside the nucleus, and protons, which are positively charged in a very small area. Only maybe one in 10,000 actually undergoes this deflection, indicating that the nucleus is very, very small. So the probability of actually striking a nucleus is small. But when it happens, the alpha particle is very strongly deflected at an extreme angle. So today we have some numbers. The mass of the proton is 1.67262 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, which is very small, but compare it to the electron, it's much larger. The electron's in the 10 to the negative 31. So if we do a mass ratio, the mass of the proton to the mass of the electron, we find that the ratio is well over 1,000. In fact, it's almost 2,000, 1,836. So that tells us the proton is much heavier than an electron. But interestingly, we now know their charges are equal and opposite. 
1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. The difference is the proton is positively charged and the electron is negatively charged. The third subatomic particle is the neutron, and this was discovered and described later, 1932. Chadwick took a thin sheet of beryllium metal, bombarded it with alpha particles, which again are positively charged, and it turned out a nuclear reaction would occur where a third type of particle got emitted, which we now call the neutron. The particle is electrically neutral, but has a mass pretty close to that of a neutron of a uh, proton. It's 1.67493, so it's a little bit greater than the proton, but again, much larger than the electron, and again, it is electrically neutral. So the position of the neutron is right next to that of the proton in the nucleus of the atom. So here we have now what we might call a synthesis. This is what we have in terms of a structure. The neutrons and protons are in a small region of space called the nucleus and the electrons are further out from the nucleus. The electrons are negatively charged. This gives us an interesting, reasonable model to describe the structure of the atom. The electrons are negatively charged, so they're attracted to the nucleus because the protons are positively charged. Most of the mass is in the nucleus because the protons and neutrons are much heavier than the electrons. So we have these light particles called electrons in orbits around the nucleus why the protons and neutrons are attracted to each other. That's called the strong nuclear force. That's not something we'll discuss much in this course. What we'll look at next, however, is atomic number, mass number, and isotopes.